Well, according to one email we received here at the church, uh, we did let some evil through these doors. Yeah, we got some hate mail. Uh, and so, yes. Um, and when I read it, I thought to myself, this is exactly what I want to talk about when, we are, when I'm talking about evil in October. It, it sort of raises up the major issues. But I must warn you in advance, because I will read you the letter, but it does have some very uh, disturbing language. So let me explain that this letter came in response to the event that we hosted for the Interfaith Alliance. It actually wasn't an All Souls program, but we hosted here in our church on behalf of the Interfaith Alliance a couple weeks ago. The speaker at that event, his name was Mikey Weinstein of the Military Religious Freedom Foundation. He spoke about the abuse of power in the military, specifically with regard to religious proselytizing. You should also know that the Interfaith Alliance has received dozens of letters like this since the event. But I was told that this one, in particular, contains all the varied strands of all the other letters all bundled into one. It says, I am a proud Christian, living and spreading the word of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ here in Tulsa. Me and my wife came to listen to the devil's own Mikey Weinstein at All Souls Unitarian Church here last Saturday. Our pastor told us the next day at Sunday service that this so-called church, quote-unquote, should be renamed as All Souls Going to Hell. <laughs> For two reasons. First, it invited one of the greatest enemies of Christ Weinstein, to even speak here in Tulsa in the first place. Second, because none at that church has been saved by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. And they, all then, will burn in the lake of fire for their rejection of our Savior. Now we listened to Mikey Weinstein speak his evil words against allowing Christ to empower our U.S. soldiers. We watched the Jew's face. We could not help but notice his face. Being a cunning Jew, he was a shrewd Jew and has a shrewd Jew face to begin with to confuse the people. <laughs> I have to tell you, at this point, at the 830 service, our humanist service, somebody in the congregation yelled out, Jesus. which is the first time that name has been lifted up from the congregation <laughs> at the 8.30 service. <laughs> the letter goes on. But the spirit of that dark face of his could only be the dark one, capitalized, himself, Satan. It was so obvious it gave my wife and me chills to behold his demonism. My wife wanted to ask him a question at the microphone about him being of Satan, but his evil glare from his dark father, the fallen angel Satan, kept her from the strength to do so. And it was useless anyway, as all the others there will burn eternally in hell with that Jew of Satan. And he had to bring his big, and I can't even get myself to say this word. It starts with N. We call it the N word in our culture. His big N word guards with him for protection. He had an African American security guard with him. He has no protection from the way, the truth, and the life of Jesus. Mikey should know that there is no protection from those who kiss the lips of Satan and reject the free gift of the love of Christ. He gets what is coming for him from the warriors of the Savior. It is only a matter of time now. Pretty intense, huh? It reminded me of the play by Arthur Miller written in 1964, Incident at Vichy. 
about a group of men waiting to be interrogated by the Gestapo, each hoping that it would not be he who is detained. Arthur Miller put it this way in his play, in the voice of his character, Jew is only the name we give to the stranger, the agony we cannot feel, that death we look at like a cold abstraction. Each man has his Jew. It is the other. And the Jews have their Jews. In other words, every culture, every religion, and every person has the, the ability, and we might even say the propensity, to dehumanize others. And the worst part of it all is that it's often done not with hatred, but with good intentions. The letter begins, I am a proud Christian, living and spreading the word of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ here in Tulsa. He goes on to talk about the way and the truth and the life of Jesus and the free gift of the love of Christ. I am not feeling the love. I don't know about you. Evil, it turns out, is not so much the equal of good as it is the perversion of good. More harm has been done by those who intended good than will ever be done by those trying to do harm. The bloody and barbaric crusades were launched by Christians to spread the truth and the life of God as they knew him. The Ku Klux Klan, America's largest Christian terrorist organization, they did not think of themselves as terrorists, but as defenders of the faith and nation. The men who flew planes into the World Trade Towers on September 11, 2001, presumably believed that they were following the will of Allah and were dealing a blow to the great Satan. More damage has been done through good intentions than by people trying to do harm. And that's why we need to be on guard, not so much that we might be tempted by blatant immorality and corruption, as much as we might be tempted by virtue and blinded to our own complicity in evil. It's been said that the devil's most successful ruse is to cloak himself in virtue. His favorite guises include patriotism, nationalism, freedom, tolerance, respectability, sophistication, and piety. And since there are likely one or two in the church this morning who might wince at the mere mention of the devil, let me be clear that just as we use the name and the image Uncle Sam as a personification of our nation, and we know that there's no actual Uncle Sam, but we also know that he symbolizes something that is very real, I use the term devil as the personification of that which tempts us and draws us towards harm and evil. In fact, we do great disservice to the devil to imagine him ugly and horned and hairy. Because the devil is more often charming, agreeable, and flattering. When we talk about evil personified, we usually think of people like Hitler and Pol Pot and Stalin and Idi Amin. But when we do this, we distract ourselves from the evil that's much closer to home. It puts our focus way out there instead of on our own capacity and co complicity with evil and the ways that we both benefit from and perpetuate it. The Cherokee Indians have that wonderful story about a grandfather talking to his grandson about how each of us has two wolves inside us vying for our allegiance and attention. One is... is represents the good and all things good and valuable, the other one, the bad. And the grandson asks his grandfather, well, well but granddad, which one wins? And the grandfather says, the one you feed. 
And yet, it sounds so simple, except the grandfather doesn't explain that we cannot always tell which one we're feeding. Sometimes we think we're feeding the good wolf when it's really the bad wolf dressed up in the good wolf's clothing. This month, as we explore the topic of evil, I don't want us to distance ourselves from it. I don't want us to just talk about it as an, in an abstract conversation. I want us to look into our own lives. Not so much to look at where we're weak and fragile and wavering, but where we're strong and self-assured and confident. When someone heard that I was going to be talking about temptation in church today, she said, good, I need that sermon. It seems everything I desire is either immoral, indecent, or fattening. <laughs> but when we look at temptation, the real danger is not so much about being tempted by our base desires for sex and alcohol and Ben and Jerry's ice cream. It's the temptation to do something good. It says in the book of Genesis in the Bible, when Eve saw that the tree was good for food and was desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She saw that it was good and it made you wise. That's why she took of the fruit. Her temptation was to do something good. Let's look at the temptations of Jesus that happened later in the Christian scriptures in the book of Matthew in chapter 4. If you look at what tempted him, it's not the lower desires like sex and alcohol. It's the higher virtues. It begins after Jesus has been fasting for 40 days in the wilderness. And it says that the devil came to him and he was hungry. And the devil said, well, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Now, I don't know what you know about fasting. I've fasted. It's something I've done quite a bit throughout my life. And I will tell you something. You cannot break a fast with bread, especially a 40-day fast. So this was not about tempting. You're not even hungry after that, at that point. This was not about tempting him with food, as it's often discussed. This was a temptation to prove himself. And the devil strikes right where we're most vulnerable at our identity. If you are who you say you are, then prove it. If you're such a good mother, if you're such a good American, if you're such a true liberal or conservative, if you're so open-minded, then prove it. This is how the devil goads us into inequity. Iniquity by pushing us to prove our virtue. And it doesn't just happen with us personally as individuals. It also happens with our entire nation. If you Americans are really so exceptional, then why don't you teach the Syrian dictator a lesson? If you are really who you say you are, a righteous nation founded on freedom and democracy, then why don't you intervene in Egypt or Libya or anywhere else where you feel you should or you could? The devil goads us not by appealing to our base desires, but by enticing us by our principles and our virtues. Into saying things like the indefinite incarceration of people without charges or trials, or due process. And into the bombing of other nations, even when we know, whether it's by drones or not, that they will and they do kill innocent children and civilians. He uses flattery. You are the only superpower left. It's up to you. You are the only exceptional nation that is guided by higher principles and is willing to do something about it. And here it comes. So if you stand for freedom and democracy and the rule of law, then just prove it. But when we prove it, we find ourselves engaging in torture 
And then we see pictures of American soldiers sicking dogs on naked Muslim men and women with bags over their heads in freezing cold prison cells. And they're all over the internet for the world to see. And the devil and Osama bin Laden are cheering. It worked. And reports of the American CIA agents torturing people in secret locations off of American soil so as to comply with the letter, if not the spirit of the law. And we let our drones kill innocent people in the name of justice and safety and security. And our government, government assassinates four of its own citizens without due process. We don't do these things as pariahs. We do them as champions of justice and democracy and civilization. It's the fascists and it's the communists and it's the dictators who spy on their own citizens and detain people indefinitely without stating the charges or giving them a trial and who use torture and who have governments that assassinate their own citizens when those citizens are deemed dangerous by the government or the military without a trial. And yet we've done all of these things in the past 10 years. Not as villains, of course, but as patriots and prophets and defenders of liberty and justice for all. For all? Back to the temptations of Jesus. Again, the devil took him to the very high mountain. And he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all the splendor. He said, all of this I will give you if you bow down and worship me. In other words, the devil said, you can become the hegemonic superpower of the entire world. You can be the dominant military and economic power forever. But it'll cost you. You will have to be willing to compromise your values sometimes and become a devotee of the great deceiver. The devil explains, it's just the cost of doing business. Just think of all the good you'll be able to do, though, if you had such power. How often are we as a nation willing to sacrifice our moral values in order to maintain our power and our position in the world? How often have we armed dictators and terrorists when it benefited our own interests? We rightly became incensed at the use of chemical weapons on innocent people in Syria and even are thinking of using it as a pretext for military intervention. But we forget to acknowledge that we were supporting and arming Saddam Hussein when he used those same chemical weapons on the Iranians. And when he did, we turned our back and watched it happen. We hold ourselves up as a morally exceptional nation, even though we are the only nation that has ever used nuclear weapons on undefended civilian populations, not once, but twice. And we quickly forget that we sprayed the forests and the people of Vietnam with chemical Agent Orange and a whole rainbow of chemicals, which the Red Cross says killed or maimed over one million Vietnamese and, since then, has led to a half a million, 500,000 Vietnamese children being born with birth defects. But, of course, that was to stop the scourge of communism in Southeast Asia and imperialism in Japan and, and Islamic theocracy in the Middle East. I raise all this not because I'm looking forward to getting a whole bunch of emails this week <laughs> from people arguing why we bombed the Japanese with nuclear weapons and why we did it a second time even after we'd proved that we had one and could do it and all that kind of stuff and all the arguments about it was it's only 750,000 people that were maimed and killed by the 
Agent Orange, not a million. You know, all the, I'm looking forward to those. I'm not looking forward to those. That's not why I bring this up. I bring this up because people have to be awake. We have to be awake to our history and awake to what's going on in the world because too many people are sleeping through it all with evil all around. I raise it to make the point that we need to stand guard over the gates of our virtue. Because people will do all kinds of wickedness in the name of good. And not any one of us is immune to it. Not any nation is immune to it. It's the temptation to righteousness. It's usually when we think we're the most moral and that we that we are actually the most vulnerable to do harm. As I traveled through Southeast Asia some years ago on a bicycle, I got myself into a lot of little, small, rural areas where tourists didn't usually go or travel. So often when the people there would see me, they'd think I must be a missionary from America because the only people they'd ever met in some of these villages were missionaries. And I got into some pretty heated conversations with locals about how Christian missionaries from the West had come into their villages and denounced and demeaned their beautiful ancient cultures and practices and religions and replaced them with a vapid, legalistic form of Christianity and told them that they and their grandparents were going to hell. These missionaries were convinced that they were spreading the truth and the way and the love of God. On a more personal note, I can remember one time when I spoke at a forum on gun control some years ago. I was, it was after one of the mass shootings in one of our schools, and I was feeling pretty self-righteous about the need for more gun safety laws as well as better enforcement of the laws that we have. And I went on with great passion and certitude about my position and particularly about the need to keep guns out of the hands of the mentally ill. Oh, was I eloquent. What I failed to realize and discovered later was that there were some folks in the audience who had been touched by mental illness. And they were deeply offended by what I said and how I said it. And felt that my position and my particular approach would further their marginalization within our society. In my righteousness... I could not see their humanity or the ways that my words and my opinions might further their oppression. And that's why as we grapple with this complicated and thorny theme of evil this month, I want us to specifically look at the places where you and I might feel the most sure of ourselves and most certain and most justified about our sense of what's right and what's true. Because that's where we're most vulnerable of doing the most harm. And so let's be modest with our virtues and let's be conscious of our virtues and our history and let us especially be awake to the ambiguities of our virtues. Because the devil is not only in the details. And the devil is not only preys on our base desires, the devil also permeates our ideas of decency and dignity and democracy and decorum and our devotion to justice and our deepest desires for safety and security. The devil doesn't go to crack houses and meth labs and brothels to recruit people. He already has those people. He comes to churches and synagogues and mosques and temples. These are the places and the people where, that are the most ripe for the picking because we are the most blinded by our righteousness and the most susceptible to the tantalizing temptation to be good. 